praise the lord we are studying the book of isaiah today we are starting from isaiah chapter 5 and verse 17 so let's read isaiah chapter 5 and verse 17 Let me read it for you. <clears throat> Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. Shall we look to the Lord in prayer? Loving Heavenly Father, we say thank you to you for the time you have given to us to gather together as a little flock and to study a word in Isaiah. Lord, we say thank you to you. for giving us these words the words of prophecy talking and revealing to us about past and also the present and also the future you have given everything lord in your word so as we go through this open our understanding that we may trust in you follow you will be faithful followers of what you have done thank you also lord for the great salvation you have given to us in christ jesus as you look at isaiah open our understanding Thank you for everyone who joined. Speak to us through your spirit. Accomplish your purpose in our lives. Committing the study of your word into your hands. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we have been looking at Isaiah. Isaiah, if you remember, is one of the major prophets. Keep this in mind. Before Christ, Isaiah roughly seven hundred seven hundred years before, followed by Daniel. and jeremiah ezekiel Th- these three are together but daniel is a senior daniel was in the capital of the babylonian kingdom ezekiel was in chebar one of the outskirts of babylonian kingdom jeremiah and jerusalem so with these things we get the major prophetic books isaiah jeremiah and ezekiel followed by daniel so major prophecies have been told to us roughly 500 years before Christ. So between Isaiah and the other three, it's 120 to 150 years gap. And what they prophesied those days, some of them are getting fulfilled in our time. So you have to think of that. So because God said, "I'll reveal everything," then only I will do anything I want. Now, what is the problem? God chose Israel through Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and twelve tribes, and He gave them a promised land. go stay there and worship me one god who created heaven and earth when the world world is full of idol worship and their own gods they created mankind so in their midst this nation of israel is supposed to be a light but they failed because they failed we have been looking at isaiah all the three prophets isaiah jeremiah ezekiel all talk about this God says, "I will bring my judgment upon you." That's what we are looking at when you came to Isaiah chapter five. If you recollect in our last study, he compared it to the vineyard. So vineyards are popular in many countries in Israel also. So vineyards, he said, "Look, I prepared the ground, I put everything, I got a vineyard, and I planted the very fine wine and all, but instead of getting." good grace i got the bad ones that's what he is looking at israel and telling them so he is continuing that and he says i am going to bring my judgment upon you so he has been talking about is a woe unto you you see we already seen in chapter 5 verse 8 it is woe unto you again he says you know this is woe unto you chapter 5 we will be seeing in the next verse god is bringing so what he says here is when i bring the judgment what will happen is the people whom you have been you know keeping them down and you, you're not allowing them to do anything the lambs the lambs he calls them the meek ones they shall have their pastures but the fat ones you see the is talking about the society some people become fat ones that is the rich ones some people very poor you should not have done it there should be a balance and the your place the people who have been going against the precepts of the lord he says strangers will eat 
So when I bring my judgment, I'm going to bring justice. That's what he says. Let's move on to next verse. He's talking about O. Look at this. This is the O. <coughs> now, verse 8 gives first O. Verse 11 has given the second O. Verse 18 gives the third one. O unto you that draw iniquity with cards of vanity. What he says is, look, when there is something wrong, it is iniquity. Again, verse 18, please. Verse 18. It is iniquity which... No, verse 18, 18. Yeah, thank you. So it is iniquity. You are drawing this iniquity. Iniquity is against God. You, you, you don't go by the follow what the principles of God. You put the cards of vanity. Cards means the ropes. And you are pulling it. As if sin, it were with a cart rope. You know, you know the cart, sometimes you connect the rope and you can pull the cart also. You are pulling it. In other words, you are bringing iniquity into the promised land of Israel. What are you doing? God is asking the question. Shall we move on to the next verse 19, please? Now, the arrogance of the Israelites, they look at God and say, they talk amongst them, let him, that let God, let him make speed. Oh, he's telling, he's going to bring judgment? Now listen, what happens is, Prophet Isaiah is pronouncing the judgment. The people are listening. They say, okay, let him bring his judgment. Let him make heal. Let him come full. Let him hasten his work. In other words, they say, let him bring his judgment upon us. That we want to see what he's going to do. And he says, let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh. Come that we may know it. See the audacities. See the arrogance they have. You want to challenge God. They said, you have come to that position. Let's move on to the verse, next one. Verse 20. Then he says, Oh, auntie, this is the fourth one. What are they doing? They call evil good. What God defines as evil, the people of God, the chosen people of God, Israel, they call it good. What God defined as good, they call it evil. That put darkness for light. Remember darkness and light? Even John talks about it. The light came and the darkness could not comprehend it. He says, you put darkness in the place of light. And you put light for darkness. You are reversing everything. You do evil and say that is light. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So complete topsy-turvy you have done your lifestyle and all that I have told you. Now let's move on to the next verse. Verse 21. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, prudent in their own sight. Now remember, what was happening to them? They are living in the promised land. And Solomon Temple, you know, that is roughly 900 to 1000, 950 or something temple was built. That is the time. And they had the temple, everything was going on. In spite of that, in spite of Moses giving them the five, first five books, in spite of that, they completely turned everything. That's what God says. I gave you all. I didn't give to any nation, but you, I gave you. What have you done? They have become prudent in their own sight. In their own sight, they are wise. So God says, I am going to bring my judgment upon you. Let's move on to the next verse, please. Now, what was one of the problems is, he talked about the vineyard. Remember, in the vineyard, you get grapes and you make the grape juice and you get a wine. The grape juice is very popular in that one because you remember that the first miracle Jesus did turning water into wine. So now they say, it says, Isaiah says, Oh, to them that are mighty to drink. They gave them, themselves up to drink and strong things. They made it very strong. So they gave themselves to this so that the wine will take control. You know, when a man drinks, the drink takes control of him after some time. Ephesians, Paul talks about it. You should be led by the spirit, not by the drink. So that is what God is now bringing through Isaiah. You are mighty to drink and you want to strong drinks. What is the problem with you? Let's move on to the next verse. Now, they are talking about bribes, which justify the wicked for reward. Wicked for reward is taking a bribe. 
So if somebody gives some money, they turn the justice away and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. So the whole country, God is looking at the nation of Israel, the people of Israel, the kings they had, and what was going on. You remember that? All these things, they had a northern kingdom, southern kingdom, both went off, northern kingdom, the first, and they followed with the southern kingdom. He says, you are taking bribes, and you are giving your judgment based on that. So, Lord is pointing out the problems which they have. Lord is pointing out to them where they have gone wrong. The idea why, why Lord is pointing out is this. He says, I'm going to bring my judgment. He is anticipating his children will repent and come back. When they come back, he will stop the judgment. That is God. So, God is love. God is also just. So let's move on further in verse 24. Now, he's talking about judgment. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, flame consumes the chaff. You know, you've seen the fire and the chaff and everything. So I've seen it in, even in our church areas when we cut off the, all the grass which is grown. We dry them in the sun and then light them up. It all burns out completely. It becomes ashes. So the root shall be as rottenness. He says like the ash, it, your root will be rottenness. Their blossom shall go up as a dust. So whatever your product, you blossom into a flower, then into a fruit, that is, uh, that is your product. This will go you know, rottenness. What you are doing, your actions are rotten. So their blossoms will go up as dust. What all you have done is just like a dust and the wind blows, it will be gone. Because you have cast away the law of the Lord. Remember Mount Sinai? Remember Moses? As they gathered and encamped around Mount Sinai, God called Moses up. He gave all the law, gave all the precepts and Remember, when God was pronouncing the Ten Commandments, every Israelite heard it, the voice of God from the Mount Sinai. As they were standing down below, they heard God speaking. It's not only Moses or Aaron. Everybody heard it. At the end of the Ten Commandments, they run to Moses and say, no, let not God speak to us. You speak to us, we listen. They didn't want even to listen when God was speaking. It's a wonderful thing to do that. We all long to do that. But they didn't want to do that. Right? Under Mount Sinai. So when they given the law, they despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Remember, when he actually spoke, they didn't want to listen. When the law was given as a written, Moses wrote it down and kept it. Along with that, even then they despised it. And God says, you are... Israel, I'm the Holy One. What's the problem with you? Why did you do that? You're the chosen people. Let's move on to the next verse, please. Verse 25. Therefore, the anger of the Lord is kindled like this. Now, you see, God doesn't say simply, I'm angry with you. He gives the reason for his anger. He has treated them with all speciality. Specifically, chosen them from the people of the world. He says, you rejected me. Therefore, I am angry with you. What is that I have not done for you? That's what God is asking. Israelites, what is that I have not done for you? Now, we need to remember, in the New Testament times, probably you'll ask the same question to believers. What is that I have not done for you? Why are you rejecting me? That, that's the kind of a question you'll be asking. Let's read verse 25. Kindle against his people, he has stretched forth his hand against them. That was not his original plan. His original plan was to bless them. His original plan was to gather them in the promised land. But he is now stretching forth his hand. And he says he has smitten them. When God brings a judgment upon his people, it is so, so strong. Even the nature, hills will tremble. That's what he says. The nature will tremble. 
their carcasses were torn in the midst of the street. That means they will die. God said they will die. In fact, if you look at right of the end of the times, even in the revelation, 50% will be gone. 50%. The rest who turn to the Lord in the second coming of Jesus, looking at him, they'll say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Not all the Israelites. And he gives a roughly percentage. The percentage is given in book of Revelation. For all these things, his anger is not turned away. What God says is, look, I am bringing my judgment upon you. God brought his judgment upon Israelites. You remember that? He first threw them out. The first ten tribes, Assyrians came and invaded them in the northern kingdom. They had dispersed them into the world. Even today, 2024, we say the lost tribes of Israel. He says, my anger is not turned away in spite of that. Then he comes and takes the southern kingdom. AD 70, gone, once and for all. So actually, Israel was taken out of the promised land. Only they were gathered first for the first coming. They were gathered again second time for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because of that, only they were gathered. So now, 1948, when God gathered, is only one reason. His feet has to touch the Mount of Olives. That's why he has gathered the Israelites in 1948. So he, what he has said is, we have to apply slowly to the Christian believers also. He says, don't turn away from me. My anger and my judgment will come upon you. Let's move on to verse 26. He says, he will lift up an ensign to the nations for all. What God says, how his judgment will come. How the people will die. I'm going to bring a nation. This is not a chosen nation like Israel. I'm going to bring a nation from far, Babylonians. And they will come. I will hasten them. They will come and invade you. So God used the Assyrians first earlier. Now he's going to bring the Babylonians. That's what it is. Verse 26. And they will hiss unto them. Verse 26, please. And will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. They'll come quite fast. Don't think you can fight them. Don't think they'll come slowly. That's not going to happen. Let's move on to verse 27. None shall be weary or stumble among them. He's talking about the nation which is coming against Israel. So he describes, don't think they'll become weary and they'll, they'll become slow down. Nothing of the sort. None of them will slumber or sleep. Neither shall the girdle of the loins be loosed. That means when they get ready to come and invade you, they will come fully prepared. There will be no stopping in between. Not the latchet of the shoes broken. So God says, when I bring my judgment, that's it. It will be done. He said that. Very nicely said. Let's move on now to verse 28. Whose arrows are sharp, all their bows are bent. Their horses' hoofs shall be counted like a flint. Their wheels like a whirlwind. You know, they are coming, fully equipped and ready for the battle. Nobody, you can't stop it. In other words, what God says, when I bring my judgment, don't think you can fight them. You see, at some times, Israel also fought. They, they had a glorious time when Solomon was there. Remember that? David, Solomon. David was fighting the, many of them. So we see those things. He fought Goliath also. So it's not going to happen this way. It's the reverse. Your yeah, enemies will overshadow you. That's all God says. Let's move on to verse 29. The roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar. Lay hold of the prey. Shall carry it away safe. None shall deliver it. Have you seen the animals like lion or tiger? How they pounce on the prey and take it. When you go to the forest, you can see that. Forest areas. And this uh, tigers are there right in the place where I live. I've seen those things. And the tiger will 
just go pounce on a, any of them, a calf or a lamb and he will carry drag it to a safe place where other animals cannot come and take the share out of his that's very interesting so they'll try they keep on pulling them pulling them pulling them the the carcass of this dead animal take it to some place and then they will start eating that's what he says they shall carry it away to safe and none shall deliver it like they do it if you have watched it i am going to do it for you that's what god says let's move on to verse 30 and in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea so you see see if you go to the sea there are some seas are very calm but you will find some of them are not calm so they will be really really bad they shall roll against them like the roaring of the sea if one look unto the land be all darkness and sorrow and the light is dark and and heavens there are what's going to happen is i will bring darkness in the place where there was light god has said that That's. now the interesting part is as we come from isaiah chapter 1 isaiah gives if you look we remember isaiah clearly says in the verse one we have already studied it earlier that he is under the kings he mentioned the kings of uzziah jotham ahaz and ezekiah kings of judah four kings he talks about it and he talks about the nation in rebellion that's what we have been talking and he talks in between he talks little bit about what is going to do in the future second chapter we had the mountain of the lord and then again is the day of the lord judgment again he brought the judgment on juda judgment on jerusalem and the, again in chapter 4 we saw the branches coming that is talking about jesus christ again verse why he moves out to vineyard so you will find when you read isaiah is a mix of past present and future always keep in mind it's a mix of that so we need to know which is past what we have studied today is is explaining to them what happened in the past therefore what is going to do in the present very important some places suddenly moves to the future like we all know that was unto us the son is born that is talking about the messiah which will come roughly 700 years after he spoke so that's what is coming now we have completed chapter 5 now we are going to moving into chapter 6 this is a very very famous chapter many times we hear about it this is the call of isaiah is very interesting isaiah puts the is call after five chapters okay after five chapters he puts the call in all clarity whereas if you go to the beginning if you recollect he says i lived under the king uzziah Jotham, Ahaz and Ezekiel. So the king Uzziah is the first one. After that followed by Jotham and others. So he was living when king Uzziah was ro- ruling. Uzziah is also known as Azariah. Okay. Chronicles and kings, they use two different names. So let's not get confused. Uzziah is also known as Azariah. So he was living under king Uzziah. Then his son and like that, three other kings apart from Uzziah, he lived. So probably... chapter 6 is the first call now isaiah will writing we, we do not know why is now putting his call right here so this is what we should know in fact when we study isaiah probably we should start with the call of isaiah then we should keep going let's move on to see the call of isaiah we have read it we have heard sermons on this very beautiful in the year that king uzziah died king uzziah died remember he started well king uzziah but then he also he did something which normally should not have done he wanted to do the job of a erenic priesthood so he wanted to uh, you know that incense he wanted to take the incense and go into the temple and the priest said don't do it don't do it he did it and he became a leper and all this we, we read all the stories let leave that one we'll come to isaiah in the day he died so isaiah starting at the end of uzziah's life he saw the lord he gets a vision lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up his train filled the temple so it's a vision 
of Isaiah. We'll pause for a moment. In the Old Testament, people get a vision, vision of the Lord. Also, remember Abraham? The pre-incarnate Jesus also came physically and met him. And there's a conversation between Abraham and the Lord. So we'll find the Lord comes in a different form. For Isaiah, it is a vision. So we need to have that difference. For Samuel, he came a student said, called Samuel, Samuel. You know, all these things. There are slight differences are there. We need to understand what is exactly happening in the physical world. Let's move on to the next verse, please. Above which stood the seraphim. Seraphim is an angel. Angels, seraphim and all. Angelic order is also there. Now, angels have an order. That's something we need to understand. God, when he created angels, much before he created mankind, much before Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, the angelic creation is talked in Isaiah as well as, we are going to see that also as we go through Isaiah. The Lucifer, he talks about it. And Ezekiel also talks about it. So one group is called seraphim. He says, one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. With twain, he covered his feet. With twain, he did fly. Pass for a moment. What did Jesus say? Angels are spiritual beings. He said that. He said that when people ask the question, you remember that Sadducees and all come and ask the question. There was a man who had, uh, so, uh, he died and the woman had so many husbands. Whose wife she will be in the resurrection? Jesus looked at him and said, you don't understand the scriptures. In the resurrection, they'll be like angels. So, in the angelic being, there's no male or female. That's what he was telling. However, there is an order. Seraphim, Michael the Archangel. Remember that? Seraphims. So, there are different orders. Angels are there. We are going to look at the seraphim. He says one had six wings. Now, if it is a spiritual being, how come you have a wings? So, we need to understand. These are all spiritual beings, but when they appear to man, they appear in a certain form. The pre-incarnate Jesus came as a human being and talked to the people. Abraham, your father Abraham longed to see me. He saw my day and he rejoiced. That's what Jesus said. So Seraphim had six wings, twin cover the face, twin cover the feet with twin. The idea is in the presence of God, he didn't want to even see the Holy God. He's covering his face. Is covering his feet. So the, the concept we need to understand fully, right? So seraphims are going. Now let's go to the next verse, please. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy. Three times he says, is the Lord God of hosts, whose the whole earth is full of his glory. Now, you'll notice all the time. When somebody refers to God, holy, holy, this always comes in three times. So there are some Bible scholars always mentioned because of Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Probably, probably. That may be the reason why it says holy, holy, holy. Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Actually, Paul talks about in Romans. You look at the whole world and they look at the whole creation. They express the glory of God, what God has done. Although in the schools and colleges, we talk to them that the whole world came by itself. There are more questions on that than on the creation of God. Everything fits in when you put the creation theory. Everything beautifully fits in, but not in the other part of the theory. Okay, okay that's another different subject. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let's move on to verse 4. This is what Isaiah is seeing. Isaiah's vision. The posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. So the angels are crying and the door posts are shaking. And the house, when he says the house, the temple of the living God. The house was filled with smoke. Full of smoke. The house that Solomon built. Full of a lot of gold and silver was there. So Isaiah suddenly sees. is filled with smoke. So you remember these prophets have seen the temple with their own eyes. They know what it's inside and all. So they know what it is. He said the house was filled with smoke. He could not even get into that. Let's move on to verse 5. 
Next verse, please. Then he said, Who is me? For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Amazing. A person who follows the Lord, when he sees the glory of the God, he will talk about his own condition. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of unclean people. People with unclean lips. That's what he says. <clears throat> so this will be the reaction of a man of God. Okay. <clears throat> if we go to Revelation, you remember that? The unbelievers, the people who don't believe in the living God, when they see God, what do they do? They go to the rocks. Oh, please hide us from the... From what? From the anger of the Lamb, they'll say. Very interesting. Okay. So that is what they will say. But a man of God will say, I'm unclean. For mine eyes have seen the King Lord of us. Instead of rejoicing, a man of God will say, Oh, I've seen God. Instead of becoming proud, he acknowledges his own sinfulness. That indicates the humility and the consciousness of sin in our lives. Let's move on to the next verse. Then flew one of the seraphims. The very, this is a very interesting part. He took a live coal. So he sees the vision. You know? It's a live coal taken out of the altar. Now the altar he talks about is in the vision. In the temple that was shown to Moses. Remember when Moses went on Mount Sinai. God said, you build the tabernacle exactly like that as I'm showing you. In other words, there is a place in heavens above. Even after resurrection, Jesus went. You remember, Mary, don't touch me. I'm not gone up to the Father. Then he goes to the Father. Hebrew says, he then presents himself with his own blood. And he comes back again on the resurrection day. Then he shows to Thomas and they touch me hands and see what you have said. So we need to understand that very clearly, right? So having said that, you see, then he flew, one of the seraphims had a coal in his hand and touches what? Let's go to the next verse. Laid it upon my mouth, lo, this has touched the lips, your iniquity is taken away, your sin is purged. Only the Lord God can take away the iniquity. Only the Lord God can purge your sin. We need to understand God lives in eternity. We live in a time frame. So the resurrection, the, the crucifixion and resurrection took place roughly 700 years after Isaiah. 650 or 700 years after Isaiah. But in eternity, it's a different story where there's no time. So all these things have taken place. That is why in the Bible sometimes when they talk about eternity, chosen before the foundation of the world, Paul has written about these children. You are chosen before the foundation of the world. Now you think we were not even born at that time. How did it happen? That is eternity. We are in time frame. We can never understand the eternity in a time frame. But when we move from time frame to eternity, which God promised we will do one day, we are going to understand many of the things. So here it happens. From there he comes, touches it. He says, your sin is forgiven. Your iniquity is taken away. That is the gospel. Is it done? Because the price has been paid by Jesus dying on the cross. As far as eternity is concerned, it is already done. Let's move on to the next verse, please. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, this is a very important question. First is experience of salvation. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. First, you enter the kingdom. Next, immediately to everyone who enters, everyone who experiences salvation, God is telling this. He heard a voice. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. That is the beauty of Isaiah. Isaiah commits himself to be on the side of the Lord. And you tell me where I go, what I say, I will do. That is the calling of every believer in Christ Jesus. We need to understand that and we need to say that. 
I am ready to go. Let's move on to verse 9, please. And he said, go. Go and do what? Tell these people, you are hearing, but you are not understanding. You are seeing, but you are not perceiving. That's the problem. Because they are doing only lip service. Say so they want to love to hear. You know, when the prophets were there, literally they also faced this. People will come, the Israelites will come, tell us, tell us what God says. They will hear, rejoice, they will not do it. That's what he says. They will definitely hear it. They are not going to understand or perceive it. Let's move on to verse 10, please. Make the heart of these people fat, make their ears heavy, shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, convert and be healed. Now, many people wonder why God said it. Is it that some people he is rejecting? Is there some people he is accepting? That's not the case. You need to understand this. God has given a free will. The man, he made him in his own image. He will never force anything. But God is a God of foreknowledge. He's God. He knows who will accept, who will not accept. Those who he will re reject in spite of doing again and again, like the Israelites. In spite of doing it, Israel rejected him. Many people, literally 50% is knocking them out. You are not my people, he says. That's what he's talking. These people who are not going to, in spite of my doing good to them, not going to hear and everything, I will leave them. I am not going to touch them. Let their ears be here. Let them see and not see. That's what it says. Eyes will be closed. Let their understanding be not there. They don't need to convince. They are not going to convince. That's all he means. The foreknowledge of God is saying this. So we need to understand it in that clarity. Let's move on to verse 11. Isaiah asked the question, Lord, how long should I wait until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, houses without a man, and the land be utterly desolate? Naturally, the question comes to everybody. Look at the disciples when Jesus talked to them. I'm going to come back again. What is this? When are you going to come? How long? How long do we have to wait? He didn't say the day. He didn't say the time. God doesn't give the time. God gives the signs. There's always the signs of the times, not the time itself. That's it. How long when he asked? He said, I'm going to give you a sign. City you will find without inhabitants. Houses without a man. Land utterly desolate. You know what it is? Read the history of the land of Israel. Very interesting. When the children of Israel are not residing in that land, the promised land, the promised land was desolate. People have written about it. Nothing grows there, they see. Rainfall is not there. And amazing when you see all these things. The productivity of the land seems to be connected with the people, chosen people, and the, how they relate to God. That's what God says. That is my sign. Until the cities be wasted without inhabitants, houses without man, you, they become desolate. You know that is the time. Isaiah, I've given you a sign on that. Let's move on to the next verse, please. The Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. What is he saying? I'm going to remove the Israelites far away. It happened. Keep that in mind. We are very far away from the time Isaiah spoke. We have seen, looking at the past, ten tribes gone by the Assyrians. Another two tribes gone by the Babylonians. It has happened. We can look back and see what God said in Isaiah has already taken place. Remove them far away. Remove them far away. Bene Manasseh. Nowadays, we read about Bene Manasseh tribe. What is that? These are the throne of people. Around the world, people are noticing. In the northeast of India, in Africa, a few other places, suddenly find a group of people behaving strangely, celebrating the Sabbath and all. They find they are the Israelites. And it's the kingdom of Israel as lives on today, they go and gather these people. That's what he said. Far away, has thrown them into far lands. God did it. God did it. Let's move on to the last verse. Verse 13. Yet, in it shall be a tenth, it shall return. Look at this. 
looking back we can see this has happened it shall return shall be eaten as a tail tree as an oak whose substance is in them as an oak when you cut the oak the substance you know when you cut a tree it will grow slowly after that when they cast the leaves so whole seed shall be the substance there are god says i'm going to throw them up yet i will gather them amazing this prophecy has been fulfilled there's nothing for us as we live in 2024 there's no reason not to believe isaiah lived roughly 700 years before christ we are living 2000 years after christ so we are talking about what is written roughly 2700 to 800 years ago and many of them have come true amazing amazing so we are completed up to chapter 6 and a few more minutes are there before we go for prayer if you got any comments or queries feel free to say so before we start our time of prayer time is open for all of you in case you want to comment anything So any comments, any questions, feel free to do so. Otherwise, we can move on to time of prayer.